The Second Book of the Aeneas The Argument Aeneas relates how the city of Troy was taken, after a ten years' siege, by the treachery of Sinon, and the stratagem of a wooden horse. He declares the fixed resolution he had taken not to survive the ruins of his country, and the various adventures he met with in the defence of it. At last, having been before advised by Hector's ghost, and now by the appearance of his mother Venus, he is prevailed upon to leave the town, and settle his household gods in another country. In order to this, he carries off his father on his shoulders, and leads his little son by the hand, his wife following them behind. When he comes to the place appointed for the general rendezvous, he finds a great confluence of people, but misses his wife whose ghost afterwards appears to him, and tells him the land which was designed for him. All were attentive to the godlike man. When from his lofty couch he thus began, Great Queen, what you command me to relate, renews the sad remembrance of our fate. An empire from its old foundations rent, and every woe the Trojans underwent. A peopled city made a desert place. All that I saw, and part of which I was. Not even the hardest of our foes could hear. Nor stern Ulysses tell without a tear. And now the latter watch of wasting night. And setting stars, to kindly rest invite. But, since you take such interest in our woe. And Troy's disastrous end desire to know. I will restrain my tears and briefly tell what in our last and fatal night befell by destiny compelled and in despair the greeks grew weary of the tedious war and by minerva's aid a fabric reared which like a steed of monstrous height appeared the sides were planked with pine they feigned it made for their return and this the vow they paid thus they pretend but in the hollow side. Selected numbers of their soldiers hide. With inward arms the dire machine they load. And iron bowels stuff the dark abode. In sight of Troy lies Tindos, an isle. While fortune did on Priam's empire smile. Renowned for wealth, but, since, a faithless bay. Where ships exposed to wind and weather lay. There was their fleet concealed. We thought, for Greece. Their sails were hoisted, and our fears release. The Trojans, cooped within their walls so long. Unbar their gates, and issue in a throng. Like swarming bees, and with delight survey. The camp deserted, where the Grecians lay. The quarters of the several chiefs they showed. Here Phoenix, here Achilles, made abode. Here joined the battles, there the navy rode. Part on the pile their wondering eyes employ. The pile by Pallas raised to ruin Troy. Thymotes first, it is doubtful whether hired. Or so the Trojan destiny required. Moved that the ramparts might be broken down. To lodge the monster fabric in the town. But Capes, and the rest of sounder mind. The fatal present to the flames designed. Or to the watery deep, at least to bore. The hollow sides, and hidden frauds explore. The giddy vulgar, as their fancies guide. With noise say nothing, and in parts divide. Laocoon, followed by a numerous crowd. Ran from the fort, and cried from far, aloud. O wretched countrymen! What fury reigns! What more than madness has possessed your brains? Think you the Grecians from your coasts are gone? And are Ulysses' arts no better known? This hollow fabric either must enclose. Within its blind recess, our secret foes. Or it is an engine raised above the town to overlook the walls, 
and then to batter down. Somewhat is sure designed, by fraud or force. Trust not their presence, nor admit the horse. Thus having said, against the steed he threw. His forceful spear, which, hissing as it flew, pierced through the yielding planks of jointed wood, and trembling in the hollow belly stood. The sides, transpierced, return a rattling sound, and groans of Greeks enclosed come issuing through the wound. And, had not heaven the fall of Troy designed, or had not men been fated to be blind, Enough was said and done to inspire a better mind. Then had our lances pierced the treacherous wood. And Aelian towers and Priam's empire stood. Meantime, with shouts, the Trojan shepherds bring. A captive Greek, in bands, before the king. Taken to take, who made himself their prey. To impose on their belief, and Troy betray fixed on his aim, and obstinately bent, to die undaunted, or to circumvent. About the captive, tides of Trojans flow, all press to see, and some insult the foe. Now hear how well the Greeks their wiles disguised. Behold a nation in a man comprised. Trembling the miscreant stood, unarmed and bound. He stared, and rolled his haggard eyes around. Then said, Alas! What earth remains, what sea? Is open to receive unhappy me? What fate a wretched fugitive attends? Scorned by my foes, abandoned by my friends? He said, and sighed, and cast a rueful eye. Our pity kindles, and our passions die. We cheer the youth to make his own defense, and freely tell us what he was, and whence. What news he could impart, we long to know, and what to credit from a captive foe. His fear at length dismissed, he said, whatever. My fate ordains, my words shall be sincere. I neither can nor dare my birth disclaim. Greece is my country. Sinan is my name. Though plunged by fortune's power in misery, tis not in fortune's power to make me lie. If any chance has hither brought the name of Polymedes, not unknown to fame, who suffered from the malice of the times, accused and sentenced for pretended crimes, because these fatal wars he would prevent, whose death the wretched Greeks too late lament. Me, then a boy, my father, poor and bare, of other means, committed to his care, his kinsman and companion in the war. While fortune favored, while his arms support the cause, and ruled the councils of the court, I made some figure there, nor was my name obscure, nor I without my share of fame. But when Ulysses, with fallacious arts, had made impression in the people's hearts, and forged a treason in my patron's name, I speak of things too far divulged by fame. My kinsmen fell. Then I, without support, in private mourned his loss, and left the court. Mad as I was, I could not bear his fate. With silent grief, but loudly blamed the state. And cursed the direful author of my woes. Twas told again, and hence my ruin rose. I threatened, if indulgent heaven once more. Would land me safely on my native shore. His death with double vengeance to restore. This moved the murderer's hate, and soon ensued. The effects of malice from a man so proud. Ambiguous rumors through the camp he spread. And sought, by treason, my devoted head. New crimes invented, left unturned no stone. To make my guilt appear, and hide his own. 
till cultures was by force and threatening wrought. But why why dwell I on that anxious thought? If on my nation just revenge you seek, and it is to appear a foe, to appear a Greek, already you my name and country know. Assuage your thirst of blood, and strike the blow. My death will both the kingly brothers please, and set in satiate Ithacus at ease. This fair unfinished tale, these broken starts, raised expectations in our longing hearts. Unknowing as we were in Grecian arts, his former trembling once again renewed. With acted fear, the villain thus pursued. Long had the Grecians, tired with fruitless care, and wearied with an unsuccessful war, resolved to raise the siege, and leave the town. And, had the gods permitted, they had gone. But off the wintry seas and southern winds, withstood their passage home, and changed their minds. Portents and prodigies their souls amazed. But most, when this stupendous pile was raised, then flaming meteors, hung in air, were seen. And thunders rattled through a sky serene. Dismayed, and fearful of some dire event, Eurypylus to inquire their fate was sent. He from the gods this dreadful answer brought. O Grecians, when the Trojan shores you sought, your passage with a virgin's blood was bought. So must your safe return be bought again. And Grecian blood once more atone the main. The spreading rumor round the people ran. All feared, and each believed himself the man. Ulysses took the advantage of their fright. Called Colchas, and produced in open sight. Then bade him name the wretch, ordained by fate. The public victim, to redeem the state. Already some presaged the dire event. And saw what sacrifice Ulysses meant. For twice five days the good old seer withstood. The intended treason, and was dumb to blood. Till, tired, with endless clamors and pursuit. Of Ithacus, he stood no longer mute. But, as it was agreed, pronounced that I was destined by the wrathful gods to die. All praised the sentence, pleased the storm should fall on one alone, whose fury threatened all. The dismal day was come, the priests prepare their leavened cakes and fillets for my hair. I followed nature's laws and must avow. I broke my bonds and fled the fatal blow. Hid in a weedy lake all night I lay. Secure of safety when they sailed away. But now what further hopes for me remain? To see my friends, or native soil, again. My tender infants, or my careful sire. Whom they returning will to death require. Will perpetrate on them their first design and take the forfeit of their heads for mine? Which, oh, if pity mortal minds can move, if there be faith below, or gods above, if innocence and truth can claim desert, yet Trojans, from an injured wretch avert, false tears true pity move, the king commands, to loose his fetters, and unbind his hands. Then adds these friendly words, dismiss thy fears. Forget the Greeks, be mine as thou wert theirs. But truly tell, was it for force or guile? Or some religious end, you raised the pile? Thus said the king. He, full of fraudful arts. This well-invented tale for truth imparts. Ye lamps of heaven. He said and lifted high. His hands now free, thou venerable sky. Inviolable powers, adored with dread. Ye fatal fillets, that once bound this head. Ye sacred altars, 
from whose flames I fled. Be all of you adjured, and grant I may. Without a crime, the ungrateful Greeks betray. Reveal the secrets of the guilty state. And justly punish whom I justly hate. But you, O king, preserve the faith you gave. If I, to save myself, your empire save. The Grecian hopes, and all the attempts they made, were only founded on Minerva's aid. But from the time when impious Diomede and false Ulysses, that inventive head, her fatal image from the temple drew, the sleeping guardians of the castle slow, her virgin statue with their bloody hands, polluted, and profaned her holy bands. From thence the tide of fortune left their shore, and ebbed much faster than it flowed before. Their courage languished, as their hopes decayed. And Pallas, now averse, refused her aid. Nor did the goddess doubtfully declare her altered mind and alienated care. When first her fatal image touched the ground, she sternly cast her glaring eyes around that sparkled as they rolled, and seemed to threat. Her heavenly limbs distilled a briny sweat. Thrice from the ground she leaped, was seen to wield her brandished lance, and shake her horrid shield. Then Colchas bade our host for flight prepare, and hope no conquest from the tedious war. Till first they sailed for Greece, with prayers besought her injured power, and better omens brought. And now their navy ploughs the watery main, yet soon expected on your shores again. With Pallas pleased, as Colchas did ordain. But first, to reconcile the blue-eyed maid, for her stolen statue and her tower betrayed, warned by the seer, to her offended name, we raised and dedicate this wondrous frame, so lofty, lest through your forbidden gates it pass, and intercept our better fates. For, once admitted there, our hopes are lost, and Troy may then a new palladium boast. For so religion and the gods ordain, that, if you violate with hands profane, Minerva's gift, your town in flames shall burn. Which omen, O ye gods, on Grycia turn. But if it climb, with your assisting hands, the Trojan walls, and in the city stands, then Troy shall Argos and Mycenae burn, and the reverse of fate on us return. With such deceits he gained their easy hearts too prone to credit his perfidious arts. What Diomede, nor Thetis' greater son, a thousand ships, nor ten years' siege, had done. False tears and fawning words the city won. A greater omen, and of worse portent, did our unwary minds with fear torment, concurring to produce the dire event. Laocoon, Neptune's priest by lot that year, with solemn pomp then sacrificed a steer. When, dreadful to behold, from sea we spied two serpents, ranked abreast, the seas divide, and smoothly sweep along the swelling tide. Their flaming crests above the waves they show, their bellies seem to burn the seas below. Their speckled tails advance to steer their course, and on the sounding shore the flying billows force. And now the strand, and now the plain they held. Their ardent eyes with bloody streaks were filled. Their nimble tongues they brandished as they came, and licked their hissing jaws, that sputtered flame. We fled amazed, their destined way they take and to Laocoon and his children make. And first around the tender boys they wind, then with their sharpened fangs their limbs and bodies grind. The wretched father, 
running to their aid. With pious haste, but vain, they next invade. Twice round his waist their winding volumes rolled. And twice about his gasping throat they fold. The priest thus doubly choked, their crests divide. And towering over his head in triumph ride. With both his hands he labors at the knots. His holy fillets the blue venom blots. His roaring fills the flitting air around. Thus, when an ox receives a glancing wound, he breaks his bands, the fatal altar flies, and with loud bellowings breaks the yielding skies. Their tasks performed, the serpents quit their prey, and to the tower of Pallas make their way. Couched at her feet, they lie protected there, by her large buckler and protended spear. Amazement seizes all, the general cry proclaims Laocoon justly doomed to die, whose hand the will of Pallas had withstood, and dared to violate the sacred wood. All vote to admit the steed, that vows be paid, and incense offered to the offended maid. A spacious breach is made, the town lies bare. Some hoisting levers, some the wheels prepare and fasten to the horse's feet, the rest. With cables haul along the unwieldy beast. Each on his fellow for assistance calls. At length the fatal fabric mounts the walls. Big with destruction. Boys with chaplets crowned. And choirs of virgins, sing and dance around. Thus raised aloft, and then descending down. It enters over our heads, and threats the town. O sacred city, built by hands divine! O valiant heroes of the Trojan line! Four times he struck, as oft the clashing sound of arms was heard, and inward groans rebound. Yet, mad with zeal, and blinded with our fate, we haul along the horse in solemn state. Then place the dire portent within the tower. Cassandra cried, and cursed the unhappy hour. Foretold our fate, but, by the God's decree. All heard, and none believed the prophecy. With branches we the fanes adorn, and waste. In jollity, the day ordained to be the last. Meantime the rapid heavens rolled down the light and on the shaded ocean rushed the night. Our men, secure, nor guards nor sentries held, but easy sleep their weary limbs compelled. The Grecians had embarked their naval powers from Tindos, and sought our well-known shores, safe under covert of the silent night, and guided by the imperial galley's light. When Sinan, favored by the partial gods, unlocked the horse, and opened his dark abodes, restored to vital air our hidden foes, who joyful from their long confinement rose, Tisander bold, and Sthenelus their guide, and dire Ulysses down the cable slide, then Thoas, Athamas, and Pyrrhus haste, nor was the Podolirian hero last, nor injured Menelaus, nor the famed Epus, who the fatal engine framed. A nameless crowd succeed, their forces join. To invade the town, oppressed with sleep and wine. Those few they find awake first meet their fate. Then to their fellows they unbar the gate. Twas in the dead of night, when sleep repairs. Our bodies worn with toils, our minds with cares. When Hector's ghost before my sight appears, a bloody shroud he seemed, and bathed in tears. Such as he was, when, by Pelides slain, Thessalian coursers dragged him o'er the plain. Swollen were his feet, as when the thongs were thrust. Through the board holes, his body black with dust. 
unlike that Hector who returned from toils of war, triumphant, in the Asian spoils, or him who made the fainting Greeks retire and launched against their navy Phrygian fire. His hair and beard stood stiffened with his gore, and all the wounds he for his country bore, now streamed afresh, and with new purple ran. I wept to see the visionary man, and, while my trance continued, thus began, O light of Trojans, and support of Troy, thy father's champion, and thy country's joy, O, oh, long expected by thy friends. From whence? Art thou so late returned for our defence? Do we behold thee, wearied as we are, with length of labours, and with toils of war? After so many funerals of thy own, art thou restored to thy declining town? But say, what wounds are these? What new disgrace? Deforms the manly features of thy face? To this the spectre no reply did frame, but answered to the cause for which he came, and, groaning from the bottom of his breast, this warning in these mournful words expressed, O God is born! Escape, by timely flight, the flames and horrors of this fatal night. The foes already have possessed the wall. Troy nods from high, and totters to her fall. Enough is paid to Priam's royal name. More than enough to duty and to fame. If by a mortal hand my father's throne could be defended, it was by mine alone. Now Troy to thee commends her future state, and gives her gods companions of thy fate. From their assistance happier walls expect, which, wandering long, at last thou shalt erect. He said, and brought me, from their blessed abodes, the venerable statues of the gods, with ancient Vesta from the sacred choir, the wreaths and relics of the immortal fire. Now peals of shouts come thundering from afar. Cries, threats, and loud laments, and mingled war. The noise approaches, though our palace stood. Aloof from streets, encompassed with a wood. Louder, and yet more loud, I hear the alarms. Of human cries distinct, and clashing arms. Fear broke my slumbers, I no longer stay. But mount the terrace, thence the town survey and hearken what the frightful sounds convey. Thus, when a flood of fire by wind is borne, crackling it rolls, and mows the standing corn, or deluges, descending on the plains, sweep over the yellow year, destroy the pains, of laboring oxen and the peasants' gains, unroot the forest oaks, and bear away. Flocks, folds, and trees, an undistinguished prey. The shepherd climbs the cliff, and sees from far. The wasteful ravage of the watery war. Then Hector's faith was manifestly cleared. And Grecian frauds in open light appeared. The palace of Dephobus ascends. In smoky flames, and catches on his friends. Though Caligon burns next, the seas are bright, with splendor not their own, and shine with Trojan light. New clamors and new clangors now arise, the sound of trumpets mixed with fighting cries. With frenzy seized, I run to meet the alarms, resolved on death, resolved to die in arms, but first to gather friends, with them to oppose if fortune favored, and repel the foes. Spurred by my courage, by my country fired, with sense of honor and revenge inspired. Pant Hughes, Apollo's priest, a sacred name, had escaped the Grecian swords, and passed the flame. With relics loaded, 
to my doors he fled. And by the hand his tender grandson led. What hope, O oh Pant Hughes? Whither can we run? Where make a stand? And what may yet be done? Scarce had I said, when Pant Hughes, with a groan. Troy is no more, and Ilium was a town. The fatal day, the appointed hour, is come. When wrathful Jove's irrevocable doom transfers the Trojan state to Grecian hands. The fire consumes the town, the foe commands. And armed hosts, an unexpected force, break from the bowels of the fatal horse. Within the gates, proud Sinan throws about the flames, and foes for entrance press without. With thousand others, whom I fear to name, more than from Argos or Mycenae came. To several posts their parties they divide. Some block the narrow streets, some scour the wide. The bold they kill, the unwary they surprise. Who fights finds death, and death finds him who flies. The warders of the gate but scarce maintain. The unequal combat, and resist in vain. I heard, and heaven, that well-born souls inspires. Prompts me through lifted swords and rising fires. To run where clashing arms and clamor calls. And rush undaunted to defend the walls. Rephaeus and Epidus by my side engage. For valor one renowned, and one for age. Dimas and Hypanes by moonlight knew. My motions and my mien, and to my party drew. With young Corebus, who by love was led. To win renown and fair Cassandra's bed. And lately brought his troops to Priam's aid. Forewarned in vain by the prophetic maid. Whom when I saw resolved in arms to fall. And that one spirit animated all. Brave souls, said I but brave, alas. In vain. Come, finish what our cruel fates ordain. You see the desperate state of our affairs. And heaven's protecting powers are deaf to prayers. The passive gods behold the Greeks defile. Their temples, and abandon to the spoil. Their own abodes, we, feeble few, conspire. To save a sinking town, involved in fire. Then let us fall, but fall amidst our foes. To spare of life the means of living shows. So bold a speech encouraged their desire. Of death, and added fuel to their fire. As hungry wolves, with raging appetite. Scour through the fields, nor fear the stormy night. Their whelps at home expect the promised food. And long to temper their dry chaps in blood. So rushed we forth at once, resolved to die. Resolved, in death, the last extremes to try. We leave the narrow lanes behind, and dare. The unequal combat in the public square. Night was our friend, our leader was despair. What tongue can tell the slaughter of that night? What eyes can weep the sorrows and affright? An ancient and imperial city falls. The streets are filled with frequent funerals. Houses and holy temples float in blood. And hostile nations make a common flood. Not only Trojans fall, but, in their turn, the vanquished triumph, and the victors mourn. Ours take new courage from despair and night. Confused the fortune is, confused the fight. All parts resound with tumults, plaints, and fears. And grisly death in sundry shapes appears. Androgeos fell among us, with his band. Who thought us Grecians newly come to land? From whence, said he, my friends, this long delay. You loiter, while the spoils are borne away. 
Our ships are laden with the Trojan store. And you, like truants, come too late ashore. He said, but soon corrected his mistake. Found, by the doubtful answers which we make. Amazed, he would have shunned the unequal fight. But we, more numerous, intercept his flight. As when some peasant, in a bushy brake, has with unwary footing pressed a snake. He starts aside, astonished, when he spies his rising crest, blue neck and rolling eyes. So from our arms surprised Androgeos flies. In vain, for him and his we compassed round. Possessed with fear, unknowing of the ground. And of their lives an easy conquest found. Thus fortune on our first endeavor smiled. Corebus then, with youthful hopes beguiled. Swollen with success, and of a daring mind. This new invention fatally designed. My friends, said he, since fortune shows the way. Tis fit we should the auspicious guide obey. For what has she these Grecian arms bestowed? But their destruction, and the Trojans good? Then change we shields, and their devices bear. Let fraud supply the want of force in war. They find us arms. This said, himself he dressed. In dead Andrigios spoils, his upper vest. His painted buckler, and his plumy crest. Thus Rufius, Dimas, all the Trojan train. Lay down their own attire, and strip the slain. Mixed with the Greeks, we go with ill presage. Flattered with hopes to glut our greedy rage. Unknown, assaulting whom we blindly meet. And strew with Grecian carcasses the street. Thus while their straggling parties we defeat. Some to the shore and safer ships retreat. And some oppressed with more ignoble fear. Remount the hollow horse, and pant in secret there. But, ah, what use of valor can be made? When heaven's propitious powers refuse their aid. Behold the royal prophetess, the fair. Cassandra, dragged by her disheveled hair. Whom not Minerva's shrine, nor sacred bands in safety could protect from sacrilegious hands. On heaven she cast her eyes, she sighed, she cried. Twas all she could her tender arms were tied. So sad a sight Corebus could not bear. But, fired with rage, distracted with despair, amid the barbarous ravishers he flew. Our leader's rash example we pursue. But storms of stones, from the proud temple's height, pour down, and on our battered helms alight. We from our friends received this fatal blow. Who thought us Grecians, as we seemed in show? They aim at the mistaken crests, from high. And ours beneath the ponderous ruin lie. Then, moved with anger and disdain, to see. Their troops dispersed, the royal virgin free. The Grecians rally, and their powers unite. With fury charge us, and renew the fight. The brother kings with Ajax join their force. And the whole squadron of Thessalian horse. Thus, when the rival winds their quarrel try. Contending for the kingdom of the sky. South, east, and west on airy coursers born. The whirlwind gathers, and the woods are torn. Then Nereus strikes the deep, the billows rise. And, mixed with ooze and sand, pollute the skies. The troops we squandered first again appear. From several quarters, and enclose the rear. They first observe, and to the rest betray. Our different speech, our borrowed arms survey. Oppressed with odds, we fall, Corebus first. At palace altar, 
by Pien Lutus pierced. Then Rufius followed, in the unequal fight. Just of his word, observant of the right. Heaven thought not so. Dimas their fate attends. With high pennies, mistaken by their friends. Nor, pant hues, thee, thy mitre, nor the bands. Of awful Phoebus, saved from impious hands. Yet Trojan flames, your testimony bear. What I performed, and what I suffered there. No sword avoiding in the fatal strife. Exposed to death, and prodigal of life. Witness, ye heavens. I live not by my fault. I strove to have deserved the death I sought. But, when I could not fight, and would have died. Born off to distance by the growing tide. Old Ephetus and I were hurried thence. With Peleus wounded, and without defense. New clamors from the invested palace ring. We run to die, or disengage the king. So hot the assault, so high the tumult rose. While ours defend, and while the Greeks oppose. As all the Dardan and Argolic race. Had been contracted in that narrow space. Or as all Ilium else were void of fear. And tumult, war, and slaughter, only there. Their targets in a tortoise cast, the foes. Secure advancing, to the turrets rose. Some mount the scaling ladders, some, more bold. Swerve upwards, and by posts and pillars hold. Their left hand gripes their bucklers in the ascent. While with their right they seize the battlement. From their demolished towers the Trojans throw. Huge heaps of stones, that, falling, crush the foe. And heavy beams and rafters from the sides. Such arms their last necessity provides. And gilded roofs, come tumbling from on high. The marks of state and ancient royalty. The guards below, fixed in the pass, attend. The charge undaunted, and the gate defend. Renewed in courage with recovered breath. A second time we ran to tempt our death. To clear the palace from the foe, succeed. The weary living, and revenge the dead. A postern door, yet unobserved and free. Joined by the length of a blind gallery. To the king's closet led, a way well known. To Hector's wife, while Priam held the throne. Through which she brought a Styanax, unseen. To cheer his grandsire and his grandsire's queen. Through this we pass, and mount the tower, from whence. With unavailing arms the Trojans make defense. From this the trembling king had oft descried. The Grecian camp, and saw their navy ride. Beams from its lofty height with swords we hew. Then, wrenching with our hands, the assault renew. And, where the rafters on the columns meet. We push them headlong with our arms and feet. The lightning flies not swifter than the fall. Nor thunder louder than the ruined wall. Down goes the top at once, the Greeks beneath. Are piecemeal torn, or pounded into death. Yet more succeed, and more to death are sent. We cease not from above, nor they below relent. Before the gate stood Pyrrhus, threatening loud with glittering arms conspicuous in the crowd. So shines, renewed in youth, the crested snake, who slept the winter in a thorny brake, and, casting off his slough when spring returns, now looks aloft, and with new glory burns, restored with poisonous herbs, his ardent sides, reflect the sun, and raised on spires he rides. High over the grass, hissing he rolls along, and brandishes by fits his forked tongue. 
proud Periphus, and fierce Automedon. His father's charioteer, together run. To force the gate, the Syrian infantry. Rush on in crowds, and the barred passage free. Entering the court, with shouts the skies they rend. And flaming firebrands to the roofs ascend. Himself, among the foremost, deals his blows. And with his axe repeated strokes bestows. On the strong doors, then all their shoulders ply. Till from the posts the brazen hinges fly. He hews apace, the double bars at length. Yield to his axe and you and arsisted strength. A mighty breach is made, the rooms concealed. Appear, and all the palaces revealed. The halls of audience, and of public state. And where the lonely queen in secret sate. Armed soldiers now by trembling maids are seen. With not a door, and scarce a space, between. The house is filled with loud laments and cries. And shrieks of women rend the vaulted skies. The fearful matrons run from place to place. And kiss the thresholds, and the posts embrace. The fatal work in human Paris plies and all his father sparkles in his eyes. Nor bars, nor fighting guards, his force sustain. The bars are broken, and the guards are slain. In rush the Greeks, and all the apartments fill. Those few defendants whom they find, they kill. Not with so fierce a rage the foaming flood. Roars, when he finds his rapid course withstood. Bears down the dams with you and arsisted sway. And sweeps the cattle and the cots away. These eyes beheld him when he marched between. The brother kings, I saw the unhappy queen. The hundred wives, and where old Priam stood. To stain his hallowed altar with his brood. The fifty nuptial beds, such hopes had he. So large a promise, of a progeny. The posts, of plated gold, and hung with spoils. Fell the reward of the proud victor's toils. Wherever the raging fire had left a space. The Grecians enter and possess the place. Perhaps you may of Priam's fate inquire. He, when he saw his regal town on fire. His ruined palace, and his entering foes. On every side inevitable woes. In arms, disused, invests his limbs, decayed. Like them, with age, a late and useless aid. His feeble shoulders scarce the weight sustain. Loaded, not armed, he creeps along with pain. Despairing of success, ambitious to be slain. Uncovered but by heaven, there stood in view. An altar, near the hearth a laurel grew. Dottered with age, whose boughs encompass round. The household gods, and shade the holy ground. Here Hecuba, with all her helpless train. Of dames, for shelter sought, but sought in vain. Driven like a flock of doves along the sky. Their images they hug, and to their altars fly. The queen when she beheld her trembling lord, and hanging by his side a heavy sword. What rage, she cried, has seized my husband's mind. What arms are these, and to what use designed? These times want other aids. Were Hector here? Even Hector now in vain, like Priam, would appear. With us, one common shelter thou shalt find or in one common fate with us be joined. She said, and with a last salute embraced. The poor old man, and by the laurel placed. Behold! Polites, one of Priam's sons. Pursued by Pyrrhus, there for safety runs. Through swords and foes, amazed and hurt, he flies. 
through empty courts and open galleries. Him Pyrrhus, urging with his lance, pursues. And often reaches, and his thrusts renews. The youth, transfixed, with lamentable cries. Expires before his wretched parents' eyes. Whom gasping at his feet when Priam saw. The fear of death gave place to nature's law. And, shaking more with anger than with age. The gods, said he, requite thy brutal rage. As sure they will, barbarian, sure they must. If there be gods in heaven, and gods be just. Who takest in wrongs an insolent delight. With a son's death to infect a father's sight. Not he, whom thou and lying fame conspire. To call thee his not he, thy vaunted sire. Thus used my wretched age, the gods he feared. The laws of nature and of nations heard. He cheered my sorrows, and, for sums of gold. The bloodless carcass of my Hector sold. Pitted the woes a parent underwent. And sent me back in safety from his tent. This said, his feeble hand a javelin threw. Which, fluttering, seemed to loiter as it flew. Just, and but barely, to the mark it held. And faintly tinkled on the brazen shield. Then Pyrrhus thus, go thou from me to fate. And to my father my foul deeds relate. Now die. With that he dragged the trembling sire. Skittering through clottered blood and holy mire. The mingled paste his murdered son had made. Hauled from beneath the violated shade. And on the sacred pile the royal victim laid. His right hand held his bloody falchion bare. His left he twisted in his hoary hair. Then, with a speeding thrust, his heart he found. The lukewarm blood came rushing through the wound. And sanguine streams disdained the sacred ground. Thus Priam fell, and shared one common fate. With Trojan ashes, and his ruined state. He, who the scepter of all Asia swayed. Whom monarchs like domestic slaves obeyed. On the bleak shore now lies the abandoned king. A headless carcass, and a nameless thing. Then, not before, I felt my crud deeled blood. Congeal with fear, my hair with horror stood. My father's image filled my pious mind. Lest equal years might equal fortune find. Again, I thought on my forsaken wife. And trembled for my son's abandoned life. I looked about, but found myself alone. Deserted at my need. My friends were gone. Some spent with toil, some with despair oppressed. Leaped headlong from the heights, the flames consumed the rest. Thus, wandering in my way, without a guide. The graceless Helen in the porch I spied. Of Vesta's temple, there she lurked alone. Muffled she sate, and, what she could, unknown. But, by the flames that cast their blaze around, that common bane of Greece and Troy I found. For Ilium burnt, she dreads the Trojan sword. More dreads the vengeance of her injured lord. Even by those gods who refuge her abhorred. Trembling with rage, the strumpet I regard. Resolved to give her guilt the due reward. Shall she triumphant sail before the wind? And leave in flames unhappy Troy behind? Shall she her kingdom and her friends review? In state attended with a captive crew. While unrevenged the good old Priam falls. And Grecian fires consume the Trojan walls? For this the Phrygian fields and Xanthian flood. Were swelled with bodies, and were drunk with blood? Tis true, a soldier can small honor gain. And boast no conquest, 
from a woman slain. Yet shall the fact not pass without applause. Of vengeance taken in so just a cause. The punished crime shall set my soul at ease. And mummying manies of my friends appease. Thus while I rave, a gleam of pleasing light. Spread o'er the place, and, shining heavenly bright. My mother stood revealed before my sight. Never so radiant did her eyes appear. Not her own star confessed a light so clear. Great in her charms, as when on gods above. She looks, and breathes herself into their love. She held my hand, the destined blow to break. Then from her rosy lips began to speak. My son, from whence this madness, this neglect? Of my commands, and those whom I protect? Why this unmanly rage? Recall to mind. Whom you forsake, what pledges leave behind? Look if your helpless father yet survive. Or, if Ascanius or Creusa live. Around your house the greedy Grecians err. And these had perished in the nightly war. But for my presence and protecting care. Not Helen's face, nor Paris, was in fault. But by the gods was this destruction brought. Now cast your eyes around, while I dissolve. The mists and films that mortal eyes involve. Purge from your sight the dross, and make you see. The shape of each avenging deity. Enlightened thus, my just commands fulfill. Nor fear obedience to your mother's will. Where yon disordered heap of ruin lies. Stones rent from stones, where clouds of dust arise. Amid that smother Neptune holds his place. Below the wall's foundation drives his mace. And heaves the building from the solid base. Look where, in arms, Imperial Juno stands. Full in the Scian gate, with loud commands. Urging on shore the tardy Grecian bands. See. Pallas, of her snaky buckler proud. Bestrides the tower, refulgent through the cloud. See. Jove new courage to the foe supplies. And arms against the town the partial deities. Haste hence, my son, this fruitless labor end. Haste, where your trembling spouse and sire attend. Haste, and a mother's care your passage shall befriend. She said and swiftly vanished from my sight. Obscure in clouds and gloomy shades of night. I looked, I listened, dreadful sounds I hear. And the dire forms of hostile gods appear. Troy sunk in flames I saw, nor could prevent. And Ilium from its old foundations rent. Rent like a mountain ash, which dared the winds and stood the sturdy strokes of laboring hinds. About the roots the cruel axe resounds. The stumps are pierced with oft-repeated wounds. The war is felt on high, the nodding crown. Now threats a fall, and throws the leafy honors down. To their united force it yields, though late. And mourns with mortal groans the approaching fate. The roots no more their upper load sustain. But down she falls, and spreads a ruin through the plain. Descending thence, I scape through foes and fire. Before the goddess, foes and flames retire. Arrived at home, he, for whose only sake, or most for his, such toils I undertake. The good Anchises, whom, by timely flight. I purposed to secure on Ida's height. Refused the journey, resolute to die. And at his funerals to the fate of Troy. Rather than exile and old age sustain. Go you, whose blood runs warm in every vein. Had heaven decreed that I should life enjoy. 
Heaven had decreed to save unhappy Troy. Tis, sure, enough, if not too much, for one. Twice to have seen our Ilium overthrown. Make haste to save the poor remaining crew. And give this useless corpse a long ado. These weak old hands suffice to stop my breath. At least the pitying foes will aid my death. To take my spoils, and leave my body bare. As for my sepulchre, let heaven take care. Tis long since I, for my celestial wife, loathed by the gods, have dragged a lingering life. Since every hour and moment I expire, blasted from heaven by Jove's avenging fire. This oft repeated, he stood fixed to die. Myself, my wife, my son, my family. Entreat, pray, beg, and raise a doleful cry. What, will he still persist, on death resolve? And in his ruin all his house involve? He still persists his reasons to maintain. Our prayers, our tears, our loud laments, are vain. Urged by despair, again I go to try. The fate of arms, resolved in fight to die. What hope remains, but what my death must give? Can I, without so dear a father, live? You term it prudence, what I baseness call. Could such a word from such a parent fall? If fortune please, and so the gods ordain. That nothing should of ruined Troy remain. And you conspire with fortune to be slain. The way to death is wide, the approach is near. For soon relentless Pyrrhus will appear. Reeking with Priam's blood the wretch who slow. The son, inhuman, in the father's view. And then the sire himself to the dire altar drew. O goddess mother, give me back to fate. Your gift was undesired, and came too late. Did you, for this, unhappy me convey? Through foes and fires, to see my house a prey? Shall I my father, wife, and son behold? Weltering in blood, each other's arms enfold? Haste! Gird my sword, though spent and overcome. Tis the last summons to receive our doom. I hear thee, fate, and I obey thy call. Not unrevenged the foe shall see my fall. Restore me to the yet unfinished fight. My death is wanting to conclude the night. Armed once again, my glittering sword I wield. While the other hand sustains my weighty shield. And forth I rush to seek the abandoned field. I went, but sad Creusa stopped my way. And crossed the threshold in my passage lay. Embraced my knees, and, when I would have gone. Shoot me my feeble sire and tender son. If death be your design, at least, said she. Take us along to share your destiny. If any farther hopes in arms remain. This place, these pledges of your love, maintain. To whom do you expose your father's life? Your sons, and mine, your now forgotten wife. While thus she fills the house with claim rouse cries. Our hearing is diverted by our eyes. For, while I held my son, in the short space. Betwixt our kisses and our last embrace. Strange to relate, from young Iola's head. A lambent flame arose, which gently spread. Around his brows, and on his temples fed. Amazed, with running water we prepare. To quench the sacred fire, and slake his hair. But old Anchises, versed in omens, reared. His hands to heaven, and this request preferred. If any vows, almighty Jove, can bend. Thy will, if piety can prayers commend. 
Confirm the glad presage which thou art pleased to send. Scarce had he said, when, on our left, we hear. A peal of rattling thunder roll in air. There shot a streaming lamp along the sky. Which on the winged lightning seemed to fly. From over the roof the blaze began to move. And, trailing, vanished in the Idean grove. It swept a path in heaven, and shone a guide. Then in a steaming stench of sulphur died. The good old man with suppliant hands implored. The gods' protection, and their star adored. Now, now, said he, my son, no more delay. I yield, I follow where heaven shews the way. Keep, O oh my country gods, our dwelling place and guard this relic of the Trojan race. This tender child. These omens are your own. And you can yet restore the ruined town. At least accomplish what your signs foreshow. I stand resigned, and am prepared to go. He said. The crackling flames appear on high. And driving sparkles dance along the sky. With Vulcan's rage the rising winds conspire. And near our palace roll the flood of fire. Haste, my dear father, it is no time to wait. And load my shoulders with a willing freight. Whatever befalls, your life shall be my care. One death, or one deliverance, we will share. My hand shall lead our little son, and you. My faithful consort, shall our steps pursue. Next, you, my servants, heed my strict commands. Without the walls a ruined temple stands. To Ceres hallowed once, a cypress nigh. Shoots up her venerable head on high. By long religion kept, there bend your feet. And in divided parties let us meet. Our country gods, the relics, and the bands. Hold you, my father, in your guiltless hands. In me it is impious holy things to bear. Red as I am with slaughter, new from war. Till in some living stream I cleanse the guilt. Of dire debate, and blood in battle spilt. Thus, ordering all that prudence could provide. I clothe my shoulders with a lion's hide. And yellow spoils, then, on my bending back. The welcome load of my dear father take. While on my better hand Ascanius hung. And with unequal paces tripped along. Creusa kept behind, by choice we stray. Through every dark and every devious way. I, who so bold and dauntless just before. The Grecian darts and shock of lances bore. At every shadow now am seized with fear. Not for myself, but for the charge I bear. Till, near the ruined gate arrived at last. Secure, and deeming all the danger past. A frightful noise of trampling feet we hear. My father, looking through the shades, with fear cried out, Haste, haste, my son, the foes are nigh. Their swords and shining armor I descry. Some hostile god, for some unknown offense, had sure bereft my mind of better sense. For, while through winding ways I took my flight, and sought the shelter of the gloomy night, alas! I lost Creusa, hard to tell. If by her fatal destiny she fell. Or weary sate, or wandered with affright. But she was lost forever to my sight. I knew not, or reflected, till I meet. My friends, at Ceres now deserted seat. We met, not one was wanting, only she. Deceived her friends, her son, and wretched me. What mad expressions did my tongue refuse? Whom did I not, of gods or men, accuse? 
This was the fatal blow, that pained me more. Than all I felt from ruined Troy before. Stung with my loss, and raving with despair. Abandoning my now forgotten care. Of counsel, comfort, and of hope bereft. My sire, my son, my country gods I left. In shining armor once again I sheathe. My limbs, not feeling wounds, nor fearing death. Then headlong to the burning walls I run. And seek the danger I was forced to shun. I tread my former tracks, through night explore. Each passage, every street I crossed before. All things were full of horror and affright. And dreadful even the silence of the night. Then to my father's house I make repair. With some small glimpse of hope to find her there. Instead of her, the cruel Greeks I met. The house was filled with foes, with flames beset. Driven on the wings of wines, whole sheets of fire. Through air transported, to the roofs aspire. From thence to Priam's palace I resort. And search the citadel and desert court. Then, unobserved, I pass by Juno's church. A guard of Grecians had possessed the porch. Their phoenix and Ulysses watch the prey. And thither all the wealth of Troy convey. The spoils which they from ransacked houses brought. And golden bowls from burning altars caught. The tables of the gods, the purple vests. The people's treasure, and the pomp of priests. A rank of wretched youths with pinioned hands, and captive matrons, in long order stands. Then, with ungoverned madness, I proclaim, through all the silent street, Creusa's name. Creusa still I call, at length she hears, and sudden through the shades of night appears. Appears, no more Creusa, nor my wife, but a pale spectre, larger than the life. Aghast, astonished, and struck dumb with fear. I stood, like bristles rose my stiffened hair. Then thus the ghost began to soothe my grief. Nor tears, nor cries, can give the dead relief. Desist, my much-loved lord, it indulge your pain. You bear no more than what the gods ordain. My fates permit me not from hence to fly. Nor he, the great controller of the sky. Long wandering ways for you the powers decree. On land hard labors, and a length of sea. Then, after many painful years are past. On Latium's happy shore you shall be cast. Where gentle Tiber from his bed beholds. The flowery meadows and the feeding folds. There end your toils, and there your fates provide. A quiet kingdom, and a royal bride. Their fortune shall the Trojan line restore. And you for lost Creusa weep no more. Fear not that I shall watch, with servile shame. The imperious looks of some proud Grecian dame. Or, stooping to the victor's lust, disgrace my goddess mother, or my royal race. And now, farewell. The parent of the gods restrains my fleeting soul in her abodes. I trust our common issue to your care. She said, and gliding past unseen in air. I strove to speak, but horror tied my tongue. And thrice about her neck my arms I flung. And, Thrice deceived, on vain embraces hung. Light as an empty dream at break of day. Or as a blast of wind, she rushed away. Thus having passed the night in fruitless pain. I to my longing friends return again. Amazed the augmented number to behold. Of men and matrons mixed, of young and old. A wretched exiled crew together brought with arms appointed, 
and with treasure fraught. Resolved, and willing, under my command. To run all hazards both of sea and land. The morn began, from Ida, to display. Her rosy cheeks, and phosphor led the day. Before the gates the Grecians took their post. And all pretense of late relief was lost. I yield to fate, unwillingly retire. And, loaded, up the hill convey my sire.